My name is Mary Mukendia. I'm an executive leadership coach. I'm also an emotional intelligence practitioner. I'm also a leadership uh, trainer, and I love mentoring as well. And I'm also a business consultant. As just a little girl from Nairobi, we grew up in Nairobi all our lives uh, because our parents, it was very, very early. So we really did not know Nyeri as such. We just used to go for the day and come back. So I'm literally a child of the 60s, born and bred in Nairobi's Upper Hill, uh, Westlands, Keleleshwa, and uh, Lovington areas, you know, Bernard Estate. And uh, we were sent to boardings very, you know, very early. I must have been five or six under two. I went to a convent school all the way in Molo. So as, I, as I'm, I'm a boarding kid school, you know, bread and butter or margarine then. Anybody who's been boarding school knows about bread. So I'm a, I'm a boarding school kid. So because from when I went to Molo, then I went to Limuru Girls, up to six, from six, then to university. That's all boarding. And then I started working. So essentially, we are the people who grew up away from home. I went to school then in Limurugas, as I said, and Molo Convent School, and then to University of Nairobi. Then we were just putting what other people look. You know, you're saying, what, what are you putting for your university? You look, you have no idea. Uh, you're hearing law, economics, something else, you know. So you just put what your friends are putting. So that time, uh, economics, Bcom sounded very hot. So we all put, you know, I want to do Bcom. And I went to University of Nairobi, we were called. Those days, we almost all of us used to be called. And um, then I realized, oh my goodness, this, this Bcom has a lot of things. I didn't know economics, maths. And I had promised myself, I do not want to do maths or, or any of subjects I have to read and I did like law so I tried to change I even went to see the Dean I was accepted so when I came to have the Dean who was then Goto Karyuki he was well known as a dissident um, you know upriser somebody who was really much more of, about civil rights and human rights um, you remember all the bearded sisters I think he was one of those but he was really a brilliant man so he said he's not changed he's not signing me to change onto law so I said why? He said, you, you're Ngubo Kimoto's sister. I know your brother, you can do this. Commerce is very good, accountancy. So of course you're young, 18 year old, you say, okay. So I stayed and did commerce <laughs> and that was the end of it. But I promised myself after I leave university, I will never read again. So I did BCom uh, marketing and never went back to school again. I'm somebody who likes to learn from experience, from life. So I'm one of the few people I say left in Kenya who does not have a master's. <laughs> well, me and another lady, we always say we are the two left in Kenya. Um, I, I think experience is very vital. I, I, there's nothing against uh, master's degrees, PhDs, if that's what you want. But I think that you can get through life also, through knowledge, through skill acquisition, through competencies, through certification. I was very lucky. In those days, when you finished universities and you applied for a job, there were so many jobs available. You imagine this is the very early 80s. Um, to give you some indication of my age, uh, I'm sure many of your viewers weren't born. <laughs> I can see you laughing and my cameraman here laughing. <laughs> so um, I, I applied for jobs and I got three jobs. Um, one in the university, one with agricultural finance and one with ExxonMobil, it was known as ESSO. And I only chose ESSO because somebody's, you know, a friend's brother worked there and said it's a good job. So I went and worked and I was really the first um, lady kind of executive or officer. Most of the women there were either secretaries or in the computer data room. You know, those days we had big computer rooms with air conditioning and data punching and no smoking or eating. So I was the really first, um, you know, sort of officer, executive officer there. And I started as a young planning and economics analyst. And I was really glad I went to a company that had systems. It was a global company, multinational. So it really, that's what brought me up. I always say I have Esodamu, you know, blood inside me because it was a very structured place, extremely um, high level standards of competency, excellence, a lot of teaching, a lot of training, and a lot of policies, which meant it was about meritocracy. It was about hard work. It was about developing people who be all round managers. We were sent all over the world in training. Uh, we were job rotated around to understand every bit operations, engineering, supply planning, marketing, you know, all the way around. I even worked in Europe, in uh, London for a couple of years and came back. So it was a place that really developed. And if you look at all the people went to all the big multinationals then, whether they were oil and gas as I did or in, um, 
in food manufacturing, in industries, they really used to train and develop a very high competency of uh, job skills. And most people, even today, have done very well. So I would say that was my beginning to a corporate career of competency. It taught me excellent, it gave me a very strong work ethic, which I had though from my dad. My dad was all about hard work and that report card. The nuns was always about hard work. Limuru girls was the same, but that just embedded that issues of ethics, of hard work, of integrity. And I just, I think in those days we just worked. You know, we, we didn't think I want to become this or that. You just work hard and you're praised and you're happy and um, you're promoted. You don't even know why you're promoted. This is, of course, is very different. You have to plan your career. You have to take control of your own career and know what it is that you want to do. Those days we were just mentored and, and nourished and, and grown. Um, and I loved it. And But in a sense, I wish I'd known some other things that it's good to think about yourself. It's good to plan your life. It's good to say, what do I want? Um, and one of the things I, when I met a young woman or even older women, I say, be very sure that you have your financial security, you know, have a recurring income, have a nest egg. We've seen with the pandemic. So for me, those are things I didn't do. I wasted a lot of money doing my hair, weave after weave, looking good, nail polish every Saturday, 3,000 shillings, Bogota, you know, OPI, there was a nail polish called Bogota, OPI. You know, pedicure, manicure, those things are so fleeting. You know, I wish I'd created that nest egg to then invest and buy tuproti, you know? So now as you can see on my paint, my painting, that's my tuproti because a lot of friends and people I know, particularly men, bought plots in little places, Kawasukari, Wapi. Now they are worth a lot of money. So understanding even as you work, think about that you'll not always be 20 or 30 or 40. You're gonna be in your mid 60s like I am and you're going to get old and you'll need insurance, you'll need medical. You'll be looking after aging parents. That's a struggle many of us at our ages are looking at. I'm with my mom who's 86 years old. We thank God he's kept her well, but I look after me and my, my, my siblings and that's an expensive route. And there are others and things that happen. So I think also getting fulfillment. So to me, fulfillment of what you really enjoy and financial security, for me, those are important. I, I enjoyed working, but I'm not sure I enjoyed the work. Today you ask me about oil and gas, people say, oh, Mary's an expert, oil and gas, you know, cause later I went into Petroleum Institute where I was general manager, we helped found that. I went into National Oil as the MD. I went into as an international civil servant, you know, with my red plate guard at UNEP doing also clean fuels and vehicles. But today, if you ask me about oil, I don't even remember, I don't like it. I don't like anything to do with oil and gas. Oh, I find it so boring, please don't. Talk. And I did that for close to 30 years. 17 in Exxon, five, four or five at the Petroleum Institute, four in National Oil, five in the, in the um, in, in, um, UNEP, makes maybe what, 24 or so. I, I really, don't tell me about oil, I don't even want to hear. You know, what really now makes me happy is helping people. You know, somebody calling me and saying, Mary, I implemented that, we discussed. You remember that idea? And we discussed it and, you know, I got some inkling and I got my aha moment and today I achieved it or I did this. I love it. In fact, I had a call today, somebody called me and they told me, remember that position? We've been working with them and it's a good friend and I recommended them somewhere. And they told me, I got a call, I got it. I love it. I just went, yes. So when people do what they love to do, I think I, I say what I do is, um, I give clarity to big ideas. People come to me with an idea of what they want to do, and then we discuss it. I help them structure, I help them think. I challenge them with questions. I challenge them with thinking a different way. I bring a kind of an insightfulness or awareness of themselves and what they love. I question them about their strengths, and by the time they leave, they say, you know what? I got my hand moment. I know exactly what I want to do and how I want to do it. So that's what I love. If I could, you know, I do it free, but I'd love to do it for more money because <laughs> I need the money. We all need the money. And I know I'm unusual. It was very easy. It was very good. But I'm also, as you can see, a very talkative lady and I'm from Nyeri and a very opinionated, very confident. And it's the way my father brought us up. As I told you, the girl was very early, so we were treated the same. My father, there was no difference between boys and girls. Four boys, two girls. Very, very strict. Not those short men from Nyeri that are tough. Eh? Uh, there was no nonsense. It was tough. Holidays, 
you that was boy as girl on a patio off nini girls ndio muna cook one day and the other one cleans the house the next day you change over i mean that was a strict he was very strict regime and um particularly so in education. So for, for us, we grew up being quite assertive, being able to have to claim your place in the family and be strong. And, and, the, and us, the nuns encourage us to do the same. Limuru girls encourage us, it's a whole girl school to be the same. So I really never had that upbringing of a woman's place, a girl's place, because we didn't live with a mother or aunties or anybody. We just thought this is the way you are, you know, bold. In fact, when I joined S, I used to be smoking, the only one smoking on the boardroom. And I remember my boss trying to tell me, eh, they had never seen, first of all, there was a first lady executive signed on. Then I'm smoking. The men are smoking, say I smoke. Then he called me to say, you know, those things, a woman, a girl, you're very nice, you're 22 there, you know, 23, can you do it in the bathroom? I said, yes, and then came back, I lit my rights, you know. <laughs> now I think, how awful. So I didn't have that. If anything, they really welcomed me. I always say that if you find, and I say 80% of people are good, majority. So when you find good people, most men want to champion women. They want to help them develop. So almost and this, of course, you'd have your normal quarrels of work. They're usually work related. I haven't had any, you know, you say about sexual harassment. Of course, you've had somebody trying to touch your breast a bit and you go, hey, and then they back away. I've never had sexual harassment. I've never had being discriminated because I was a woman. I was always very articulate and very kind of aware of myself. And I think when you call out people, you don't get that reason. It's when I think you are being nice, you keep it to yourself, you don't want to talk, you tell somebody else instead of telling the person. You know those challenging, difficult conversations are difficult, but sometimes you do need to step up. I didn't have any issues. I was encouraged, I was promoted. I remember one guy was telling him the other day, we have this WhatsApp group called Esodamu, and we met the other day at the club, and I told him, you know, remember, I heard that you said that kama being promoted, ni kufanya kazi kama Mary, wacha ikai. <laughs> because literally, I was a workaholic, and I think that's what took me through, and I regret that, because I literally used to work 14, 15 hours. To me, it was, I didn't, you know, I didn't have family, I didn't have anything, I was just obsessed with my job. So no, I, I found it very easy. And I was like a novelty, first woman. I was covered in the newspapers, I was covered going abroad. I was in the Lux Woman of Excellence. I got awards, Eve Magazine. So it was easier in a way, good for us who are fewer. My passion, I'm not sure you're sure yet on purpose. And I think we're told, don't worry too much. You will grow into it. I'm sure people say, guy 65, she doesn't have a purpose. I think my purpose is helping people, but I think my passion is to really help people maximize their potential. I really, I mean, I feel like, yes, when I help people realize how awesome they are because we are all so fearfully and wonderfully made and we are all awesome. So helping people find what they love to do, find that passion for themselves, find that next level career that they need, show them how to do it in terms of a methodology because there's a methodology to being successful. There's a methodology of positioning yourself for your next job. And that's why I do coaching. In fact, I'm developing a, a digitized career program where I'll do group coaching. Because if you use the right methodology, you will get to that next level of job that you want, that career, that leadership position. But there are certain things you have to do yourself. For example, we put ourselves down as women. Why? We don't need permission. We don't toot our own horn and say, I'm good at this. You wait for other people to kind of say you're good. If you're good, say you're good. I think I'm good as a coach. I think I'm good as a trainer and I am good. People tell me, Mary has connections. You won't connect with anybody. I believe I can get to anybody anywhere. So I'm good at those things. I'm good at helping people and supporting people. The other one is using networks. We don't, we are even our friends, your phone. How many networks you have there? You just have to call them and say, you guys, I need to know somebody, this company, that company, I'm dealing with this. Who knows somebody? Believe me, people, I think people are always ready to help you. So we don't like to ask for help. We don't like to use our network, our friends, people we went to school with, people we were in college with, people we worked with. So there is a methodology on how to build your profile, how to network, how to ensure that you're being seen, and more particularly, what do you want? A lot of people, when I ask them, what do you want? Oh, mm -mm. what do you want? If God came today and said, forget the money, that will be sorted. What would you like to do that gives you passion, that gives you happiness? Most people tell you. <laughs> they have to think about it. So you have to know what you want, because otherwise any road will take you there. In my career, I think I was very foolish. 
and I really tell my clients and even people I mentor, I give too much to the company. I don't know why I thought I was Mrs. Atlas carrying the world of ESO and that they were poor and I, I was rich, I could donate to them my time. I forgot that, um, and I tell people a lot, that work is a contract. Buy, sell. I'm selling you my time, eight hours, and you're buying my time and my skills. And those 14 hours I'm being proud of working and all those, it was, sincerely, it was not clever. I could say the other word I was about to say, it was not clever. Because these companies take that time, it's up to you volunteer, you're donating, good. But at the end of the time, you know, a company is a very amorphous creature. It's not one person. It's not Grace. It's not Mary. It doesn't have a memory to remember how wonderful you've done through the years. People come and go. It's an, actually an entity. And it can be sued and be sued, but it's, it's got no feelings. So after giving your time all these years and you want to leave, nobody will recognize and remember, oh, this person worked. They just are very clinical. So when I left ESO, A, I didn't have a single pension, not a shilling. My house was being sold because I thought I would get out, take the mortgage to another company, start building my company. I just did not organize my departure. I had no car because I had a company car I'd put equity in. The pension fund, the way it was, it was before RBA law became into effect. The year before, I left in 97. So I got only my portion of the pension at was it 4% interest. Nothing. And my, Loan mortgage at one time for my house was 29%. Those were the crazy 90s, end of, you know, the late 90s. I had nothing. My house was being sold. I had no car. I remember taking a matatu to go and get some money from somebody at Motaiga Club. And I was so squeezed in that matatu. I understood why people died. Because I'd been waiting for an empty matatu on Kiambu Road. There's no empty one. To me, they look full, but people get in. That's us were getting in. So I had to get in because the person was going to play golf at Wins and I needed my money. I was that broke. My sister gave me like a little Wadenga car, lovely to, you know, to drive around. So that showed me that you've got to be very, you only have that resource of time. And how you manage that time and who you give it to, there's no donation. Work ethically and faithful for who you work for, but over and above, don't give any extra. Use that time for yourself to build yourself in whatever you would want to do. So that was lesson number one. Two, I didn't invest. Saturday I was driving, manicure, hair, smoking, car, credit card, BMW. Oh, my friends thinking, I'll get married, there'll be money. Please, it's you and you. So that's something, that's why I'm still working at this age, but I enjoy it, but that's something I learned. The other one is stick to your ethics. I didn't do a second term at my job after you know after national oil i was offered a second term and i didn't take it and the reasons were i wanted to maintain who i was and be strong because i'd taken some decisions that were tough and um they didn't get me into trouble but they didn't win me a popularity contest and i knew going in for a second term when people are looking out for you because you didn't obey what they thought you should do, and yet I had my integrity, what I think as a CEO is my authority to do, I didn't want to have that clash of personality. In any case, they weren't paying the moon. They were paying those parasitic jobs at those days. I think I was being paid 420,000, started at 360, 380, and then by the time I think it was 420,000 a month. I could make much more doing other things. And I'm glad in a sense, I didn't have a job for a while. Um, but then I, UNEP asked me if I wanted to work for them. And you see what happened. I was called by UNEP to apply. Um, so that was a difficult time where I made the decision to leave. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll have six months notice while looking for a job because I need to sign. I thought it was important. I'd be needed to sign, finish the year because it was April. My contract was expiring in April. And I thought until June, I wanted to close the year, show my results. And I thought, no, if you're going, go. And I was like, see, I'm mean, this indispensable, wonderful lady who's even won an MBS and I've been commended as one of the parastatals awarded, uh, got a third position in the performance contract. I said, no, if she wants to go, let her go. So it, it showed me that um, when you step on some toes because of what you want to do, uh, it's important. We were robbed at that time. Um, if I were not starting national, well, it, it was very difficult for them for the management to take to me. But after some time, I think they realized I was being genuine. But we literally had to ask everybody to reapply their job, the senior management. And it's only when I got a good team 
that actually we started making changes. I thought I was again Mrs. Atlas coming with my knowledge. I will take the people there. I'll show them what the truth is and how we can make money as national oil, what we need to do. It wasn't impossible. There were some very good people there, but it's just we were on at two different levels. So when the board authorized, after very many months that we reapply and uh, you know get the, start, the senior management, and we brought in a new team. That's when I realized I alone could never have done any of that work. The team is what helped us succeed. So that gave me a very strong thing that whatever you do, even if you have all the brains or the money, what you really need is a people, a good team. So these days, sometimes I don't focus on having the best solution or having the lots of money to get a strategy to work. It's the team that actually gets you there. I think I term success if I'm healthy, If I'm doing something I truly enjoy and have a good night's sleep, that my children are happy, if they if they're not getting the you know the degrees I wanted them to do and they have not gone to college the way they as they were supposed to go because they haven't and those things used to freak me out, but now they are being themselves and they are happy. So I've realized I can't the degrees were for them, not for me. So why are you getting annoyed? They don't have them or they have taken a different route to get there. And that's been a lesson for me. That, you know, it was very important that my children also do this and they're going to England and doing this. No, it does not matter. So being comfortable and happy with yourself and that you're helping other people, to me that's success. Really that success, because it's every day. To tomorrow is that, look at this pandemic. We thought we were this and then suddenly the pandemic have, has come in and you've realized, actually you're not a very good person or actually you're a very fearful person. I didn't leave this house for seven months when it first came. Seven inches, Sijaenda. My age, and I have my mother's 86, and my children will bring me, will die, and I'm the ATM of the family. What will happen? So I realize I'm a very fearful person, and I have to relax and say, you know what? Life is life. What will happen? Take reasonable precautions. So we live and learn with ourselves every day, and I think at any one time we will change. So for me right now, is being happy with who I am. And if I'm doing what really makes me happy and helping other people and I see them genuinely helpful and that my children are also, they're also happy and finding themselves. And I'm living up to my responsibility, maybe not all of them, but at least Kidogo. Forming the Petroleum Institute, that to me is a highlight. Every day I look back and I say, that thing we did on my kitchen table, I had a group of founder members from industry who were fantastic, we formed it, it's still going. We started training programs and then my, my predecessor took it over and created the School of Petroleum. It's moving, George Washera, who was my former boss in the ESSO job, I was saying, the one who told me about smoking. He came later and succeeded me when I went to National Oil. To me, that is just, that we cre created something and it's still there and it's useful to industry to help people learning to understand and to bring about legislation and change. I, I just, I think that's wonderful. Um, some of the others, I'm pretty proud of my MBS, my Moran of the Burning Spear. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, that, you know, it's good to get recognition that you did something. Um, that is good. Of course, my children, I think, I think who doesn't? I think, I think, I think that's, that's nice. And uh, if I've made some contributions somewhere and people say you've made contributions, that to me is perfect. Not many, but I, 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 I'm happy with what I have. I say this and I used to say it a lot and I still emphasize it. You will not succeed, particularly as a career woman or a business working woman with the hours, even in the market. See, they go to the market and they stay in Karatina market the whole day, the whole day and go back, unless you have a good support system. So I've always said, please have good staff who become part of your family. And for me, I, the essentials were a driver and somebody to be with your house with who can take care of your needs. So for example, Lucy, whom you saw when you came in and being sanitized and all those many things, she's been with me, is it 17? 17, close to 18 years. Yeah. Uh, I had a driver who was with me. He took, coming back from hospital with the two children in the basket, Michael. Michael is part of our family. I was with him 11 years. Even today, Michael Zenya Machoma from Ruaka, and he will visit here and will stay. Because when I went to National Oil, 
he became part of the staff, and I did not think it was fair to take him with me now to private practice where, as you know, I didn't even have a job. I was saying, what will I do? When he already had a job where it would give him, um, you know, medical, he would give him all those benefits. But we're still good friends. I, I don't see him for a long time, but he's just a family friend. I know his family. We've worked together, his wife. So I was with him 11 years. So I tend all my stuff. I tend to keep it for a long time. So those are the people who took care of my children. Driver, take the kids to school, pick them from school every day to sing. Lucy, Nikki and abroad, wapi, going late, Lucy. And of course, when I traveled, my mom used to come and stay. We're lucky you have a mother come and stay because sometimes you want somebody who will be able to dash them to hospital, drive the car and so on. But Lucy did her driving, though she doesn't drive. She'd ask her why she doesn't drive. She did driving. I wanted her to start driving. She manages this house. Literally, she's a manager. So what I say, when you have a good team, make them part of the family, but pay them well. I get so cross when I hear about people not paying their staff well. These are people living with you every day, eating your food yourself. You eat the same food, you use the same water, the same bathrooms. What are your most precious possessions? Your children, your career that you're going to so that you can have it, and your house, your furniture, all your possessions. So why would you not pay them well? So I've always paid whatever is the standard and higher. That way they know you appreciate them. If they work on a holiday, pay them double. Those are the union rules say, pay them double. So I've always said I will pay excellent rates. So I, 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 I think I'm, and give them autonomy to do their work. Stop telling them how to do their work. That's their area, that's their specialities. She's actually a very good cook. She has recipes from online. If I do a dinner here, big high level dinner, she does everything. Baking, bit loaves, roasted this with the strings, Christmas dinners, excellent. She learned it herself, teaching herself, so. That's the one thing, actually, I really am regretful. I, I do absolutely zero, other than, of course, my wine and uh, uh, fun. I don't. I, do, I don't do exercise, I don't do fun. And it's sad. Today, I went to a baratam, which is the first time in weeks. And I've been saying I'll do it every day, walking, so I have my health because really at my age I should be doing every day. I really ought to do that. I haven't taken a holiday in more than two years. Well, it's expensive and there's pandemic and I'm paranoid. So, oh goodness, I don't. But I, I would love to do what I used to do was have friends and I love entertaining. So having friends and we just have a fun time telling stories, laughing, enjoying, everybody talking about, you know, what do they like to do? what's happening in their lives. I love entertaining. So that's something I'm hoping, now that we are almost all vaccinated. I, I'm the master of sending on my, I have a full circle with Mary. I have about 110 women. So I'm sending, where can you get vaccinated? The first time, if the people would even send pictures of the queue, then I would send to the others, and the others would say there's another place. So I'm the master of all this. So now given that we have all, I was a COVAX vaccine, uh, kind of COVAX uh, ambassador. Now that we're all vaccinated, I'm really hoping to go back and have people. And you know, it's not expensive. We tell people, bring a potluck, you know? Bring a bottle, bring a dish. You'd be amazed people always bring more than for one. So you end up with a fantastic evening. That's what I actually love doing for fun. That, and I love movies. I love watching movies. Sometimes too much of an addict, I will admit. I need to stop. So I'll be Netflixing or whatever it is, yeah. Particularly documentaries. I love documentaries. Yes, I was a big reader. I still read, but not as much. Because of now documentaries, I, I tend not to, but because I'm starting to say, I need to shut off social media because I get obsessed. I watch news throughout, but not Kenyan news. I usually watch a lot of foreign news. Al Jazeera, America, Trump, vaccine, what's going on, and other stories, you know? Um, and then I'll probably watch YouTube, whatever is interesting there. So I'm starting to, I really need to cut down my social media hours and just be able to not stress out, trying to take on what's happening in the world. So now I'm starting, that's why I was reading the book I was mentioning, so I'm now starting to go back and I hope I can really get back into, into reading because reading is an escape. You go to a beautiful world and you use your imagination. But my children are readers. I made them read when they were growing up. They would not watch TV on the weekend if they had not read a book and written to me a novel. That, you know that story from that uh, Dr. Carson? I implemented it. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they love books, they're great readers too. I would tell her to realize that um, her career is just a beginning. 
it will not define her. She should really try and f use it to discover what she's good at and what she enjoys reading, you know, uh, enjoys doing, I mean. Find out what really kicks you, you know, what gives you that kick, what, make, what you love to do. Is it creating art? Is it uh, singing? Is it, uh, you know, uh, explaining to people what to do or um, leading others or is it selling? Just find out what it is that you enjoy doing then start to build a competence in that. Start training yourself, getting assignments, volunteering to do more of that, asking for transfers in between jobs so that you can know more. And then when you've done that, start to say, how can I nurture this into a skill or a business that I can even do part-time or after? How can I be able to document some of this? And then please save, 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 save. Life is very simple. Don't go for the things that I did and many of us do of self-image. So long as you dress simple. I now wear white all the time. People don't even know if I wore this yesterday or I wore the shirt. The same shirt yesterday can be washed and I put back. Life is very simple. Let's not, you know, complicate it. Be very simple and classic in the way you do things, but don't spend an enormous amount of money on things that are transitory. You know, on brands, on this and that. Save that money and learn how to invest. You go to Centonomy. Washeke Ndwati is a wonderful lady who started Centonomy and asking people to be clever and understand about money. And uh, many know her and her company's really grown. I remember when she started down, used to come to us in Alabastron. So really learn that you need to have that financial security for yourself. And then finding what you love, that financial security, then get a deep sense of who, who are you in terms of as a human being on this earth? Who's your maker? I'm still a journey, but if you can find another reason why you're here on earth as you get excellent at what you do, that, that should be good for you. And create relationships. Everywhere you go, create relationships. You don't know when you will need them. Networking, that is such a huge benefit to all of us. So you can use these networks and they can use you too. You help people out. I think those four are what I would always say. I'm on social media and my Twitter handle is at Mary um, Mukindia, which is a double M for the Mukindia, Mary double M UK India. I'm also on Instagram at also Mary Mukindia, which is Mary double M UK India, it's in the countries. I'm also at LinkedIn. I'm actually most active on LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm also at LinkedIn, also at Mary Mukindia. And we're actually having a conference on the next month, 13th and 14th of October, on emotional intelligence. Let me tell you, everybody needs emotional intelligence. In your life, with your spouse, with your children, with your work, with your boss, that boss that frustrates you is temperamental. Come and learn why is it temperamental and how can you overcome that? Because it's about self-awareness, about awareness of others. It's about, you know, being genuine. It's about resilience, how do you build resilience, about inspiring performances. And if you connect with me on LinkedIn or you go to Profiles International, you'll see about the conference. And if you, re if you come in now, you'll actually have access, virtual access is virtual for two days. You'll also be able to get your own individual emotional intelligent assessment to know where you are. And you'll also get an individual debrief of your results one-on-one. -on -one. You never know, I could be the coach that's debriefing you. So that would be great. And you'll get access to the recordings of the whole conference for up to one year. So please come. Emotional intelligence, you know, World Economic Forum in Davos, every year, even last year said, it's one of the five most critical skills that employees and leaders need. So you really must come to the conference. You pay for it, but it's well worth it. So go online, check it out, and join us 13th and 14th of October.